If you want to study contemporary theories of translation, at least in the European tradition, I think you should start with the concept of equivalence. So, very quickly, what do we mean by equivalence? Equivalence is equal value, and equivalence just posits that between a source text and a target text, a relationship of equal value is possible on some level. The theory never said that the whole target text, the whole translation, had exactly the same value as the whole of the source text in form or function or usage or whatever. It always posited that on some level uh, a relationship of equal value was possible. And the trick is then to state where that value lies. Is the value in the form? Is it the length of the text? Is it the aesthetic qualities of the text? Is it the way it has an effect on users? Uh, is it the way it had an effect on the original users compared with the target side users? All those debates enter into the paradigm of equivalence. I, I, there are a lot of theories out there and a lot of ideas that deal with those problems and I find it useful to make a very simple distinction between two ways of thinking about the problems. On the one hand, there would be theories of natural equivalence. And these theories suppose that the translator sees a problem, grasps the value, and looks around in the target language and the target culture for the item with the same value. Okay? So the translator looks for an equivalent that exists already somewhere in the language and culture. That would be natural equivalence because the equivalence is presumed to exist prior to the act of translating. On the other hand, there are theories of what I would call directional equivalence, which uh, say that uh, the translator is actively going to create something, something new, in the target language and culture, uh, which will maintain an equivalence relationship, regardless of whatever existed prior to the act of translating. Now, these two ways of thinking are, are quite different. You can ask simple questions about any theory you come across. You can say, well, if it says that I go from A to B, uh, equivalent value, equivalent value, does it also assume, does the theory assume that I can go from B back to A? Okay. Uh, we might have a theory that says that uh, cricket in uh, British culture, at least English culture, is the equivalent of baseball in American culture. And so if I go from cricket, I look around, summer sport with ball, and I get baseball. And if I ask the same question, I can go back. What's the equivalent of baseball? Cricket. What's the equivalent of cricket? Baseball. If you look at uh, Vinay and Dabelnay in their uh, early work on uh, comparing French and English, uh, they have uh, under equivalence, equivalence, English expression. Like a bull in a china shop. China is porcelain, okay? What does a bull do in a shop full of plates? It breaks plates. So to come in like a bull in a china shop is to come in roughly and smash things around. In French, they suggest, uh, comme un chien dans un jeu de quille, uh, which would mean like a dog uh, in a game of skittles. So at the origin, equivalence was never, you see, uh, presupposing a literal matching function or anything like that on the level of the phrase or, 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 or the sentence. It was for these special cases uh, when something radically different in the two cultures more or less had the same function. The term equivalence was nevertheless extended significantly, uh, especially by Eugene Nyder, who uh, came along and proposed that in fact there were two kinds of equivalence, um, dynamic, which would be this kind, and form, which had more respect for what was happening in the source culture. So, uh, formally, uh, 
uh, you could say, I guess, in French, like a bull in a china shop, just translate that literally, and that would be one kind of equivalence. Uh, neither uh, in his work uh, with, you, with uh, Taylor especially, um, goes a bit further. It is, you know, the term is getting bigger and bigger because you recognize two kinds of equivalence there, but he insists that translation or the definition of translation is based on the closest natural equivalent. And as long as that definition informs how we see translation, we are very much within the theory of, or the paradigm of, uh, natural equivalence. Now, it's important to stress that those two concepts, natural versus directional equivalence, belong to ways of thinking about equivalence. You don't go into a text and say, oh, that's natural, that's directional, that's natural. Uh, I'm really talking about the theorization process, the presuppositions that enter into the ideas of what a translation should do. I also stress that those two kinds of equivalence can appear within the same text and within the thinking of the same theorist. Vinay and Dabalé, for example, do recognize uh, calques uh, and borrowings, loan words, as translation strategies. Those would obviously fit into directional equivalence, and then uh, they have a whole string of strategies for maintaining uh, natural equivalence. Uh, Eugene Nider, as we said, has his concept of translation based within natural equivalence, but when he talks about formal equivalence and, and making a choice between one kind and the other, then he would be within a, a directional paradigm for me. So, I'm not going to pick up the names of people and put them in one paradigm or the other. It's necessary to be a little more subtle than that. Finally, uh, why is it important to stress that there are these two kinds of equivalents at work? And they were there, I think, in the beginning of the, of, of the paradigm. In the 1950s and 1960s, uh, in the age of structuralist linguistics, uh, it was quite common to say that in between one language system here and one language system there, there was no possible translation, since languages were seen as dividing up the world in very different ways and giving very different world views. This is the von Humboldt tradition, the, the, the language as a worldview. Within that frame, translation seemed to be impossible. And yet, these theorists came out and said, well, translation nevertheless exists. You see this very clearly in the early work of Georges Mounin. And there was something quite heroic in proclaiming the existence of equivalence in the age of structuralist linguistics. It was quite revolutionary. Uh, it was going to meet some opposition. I think uh, it's therefore useful to go back and reread some of these theorists in their own age and in their own term and realize that some of the early work that might seem naive to us now was actually quite revolutionary in its own day and age.